about a year ago, like almost a year ago to the day that we are recording, we did an episode with a gentleman by the name of Eliezer Yukowski. Uh, I don't know if you know him at all or have run across him in your travels. Um, so we thought, David and I thought in our um, more innocent days, that we were going to have a nice conversation with Eliezer Yukowski about the interplay between AI and crypto. And uh, it turned out that was not the conversation Destiny had in store for us. It turned out... We got stuck. <laughs> yeah, we got stuck somewhere. And we were going to end that episode in a full-blown existential crisis about this thing. I didn't know as much about as I feel like I know today, but yet I'm still kind of like wondering how much I really know. That is AI safety. And Eliezer offered a compelling argument for basically why we titled the episode why AI is going to kill us all because that was the distinct impression he left us with. In fact, the episode, the entire episode was a dire warning, like halt all AI progress good, you know, like right now, you know, uh, go, go be with your loved ones, kiss your, your children goodbye, because, uh, we're not going to make Brian it. Went and, and followed that advice. Actually, yeah. <laughs> after that <laughs> well, it never, it's never bad advice to go to, you know, like tell yeah. the people, uh, in your life, you love him. And, and so we're having you on partially, uh, Beth, because you stand on pretty much the opposite side of that argument, I think. And not only do you not think that AI is going to kill us, you think it's going to be great. Like maybe usher us into a utopia. Okay. So this is not like, uh, he was right. And some, you, you, I think, are saying Eliezer is, is dead wrong. In fact, it's the complete opposite. And we should accelerate progress on AI completely across the board. And so uh, Bankless is a uh, technology podcast, but, but very specific in, in, in the crypto community. And I want to give you the chance to um, s explain your side of the argument. I want to give you a chance to pitch effective accelerationism, EAC, to the crypto audience, and just like pill us, that straight up pill us. Like, give us the gospel of EAC, Beth. Getting right into it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <clears throat> um, you know, yeah, I, I, that 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 Yudkowsky podcast really, really was, uh, I, I think, the start for you all to to get into this sort of uh this sort of area. Uh, did you did it tumble across your feed? It definitely did. It definitely okay. did. Um, I I I think like this sort of uh, yeah, doom mongering or fear mongering it has been really nefarious. Like it, it it's really affected people psychologically, right? I mean, but yet and yet like you know they thought GPT two was gonna kill us all. GPT three, we're at GPT four, four point five soon. Yet we're still here. Right, the economy hasn't collapsed. Everything, everything's fine. The, the the crypto bags are still, you know, they're 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 doing all right. They're doing all right these days. Uh, but but these are the last days, maybe, Beth. That's what Elise here would say. Is like enjoy the last days. <laughs> no, I I think that um, th that's the thing about having a system that is uh, malleable and adaptive, even if you have new technologies that are progressively rolled out it just morphs and absorbs that capability uh, and, and provide and creates utility out of uh, those, uh, those new technological capabilities. And, and really EAC is about trying to understand where do we come from and where are we going, right? What is the process? What is the process that gave rise to life? What is the process that gave rise to civilization? What is the sort of this weird, you know, clearly something's going on, right? Like when, when we were maybe, you know, ch children, you know, we had like massive computers that were exponentially worse than the ones we're using to converse today. Something's going on. There's a sort of evolutionary process in the space of technologies, in the space of ideas. Uh, you know, what is this machine? What is this process that's always um, uh, morphing and adapting uh, civilization and the technologies around us? And and really, EAC at, fir at first and foremost is trying to understand this process how does it work? How did it get us here? Why is it good? And and then how do we accelerate it? Right. And, you know, that's what we call, you know, acceleration or, or techno capital acceleration or more generally homo techno capital mimetic acceleration. So that's like all the things, right. Um, essentially we think that um, this process of searching over the space of parameters or bits of information and how we organize ourselves culturally in terms of uh, um, 
genetics of humans, in terms of the space of technologies, in terms of how to organize companies, nations, etc. It's it's all one big search process, and competition induces a sort of evolutionarily evolutionary selective pressure on the space of of all these things, and that sort of uh, competition breeds fitness that then. Uh, benefits us all, right? Like in a sense, like we've tried, we've tried capitalism and freedom versus sort of authoritarianism uh, uh, or, or, or communism, where everything's top down prescribed, prices are essentially controlled. So far, free markets have been far more successful at creating wonderful things, such as the technologies we use to to chat with today and the system we live in today. And overall. Um, such systems where you have many more freedoms, you find much better optima uh, in terms of, uh, again, technology is ways to live your life uh, uh, um, and, and just about everything. Um, but it's, um, I think, I think it's too broad of a question. Like just pill me on EAC. Um, I think like, let's, let's just, let's go through what, how you feel about doomerism and it's just, let's just pick it apart. Really. Let's just pick it apart. Yeah. I kind of want to do one more thing first, just to kind of frame this conversation. One of the um, maybe di- like disarming things about the conversation that we had with Eliezer Yudkowsky that maybe like me and Ryan just weren't ready for is that Eliezer's arguments were extremely technical. They went down to the basement on like how AI works. He was using phrases called like gradient descent and, uh, you know, reward mechanisms. And it all got like outside of our frame of expertise very quickly because he was like down at the basement level. And he was making like this kind of logical argument that like me and Ryan were just like weren't ready to like fully unpack because he got really, really technical. And this um, this conversation, this EAC versus D cell, people can approach this conversation at like varying uh, like um, heights. Like some people I think... Uh, Mark Andreessen wrote the Techno Optimist Manifesto, talking about this at a very high level. And then we went and me and Ryan did a number of episodes about AI safety. And each one of those conversations were like at somewhere up and down in the very technical to very philosophical like conversation. I'm wondering where you see your innovation with this conversation. You run an AI startup, so you're pretty technical, but you're also um, just in your response just now is some pretty philosophical directional like approaches. Where would you say you you would like to innovate in this conversation? Yeah, I mean, whatever you think is more appropriate for your audience. For me, it's always difficult to to adjust my level of of, uh, technicality. I tend to converse pretty technically. You know, I was a theoretical physicist, and then now I run an AI startup. Um, Usually, I have very uh, sort of mathematics-first thinking, trying to explain uh, my thinking, and I have to uh, convert that into uh, English (laughs) to some extent. Um, and so, you know, if, if there's any words I say or anything like that, that you want to dig in, like let, let's dig in. But I, I would say, I would say Yud is not very technical actually. Hmm. Um, and that if, if you start digging into his technical knowledge, it's, it's, it's quite, it's actually lacking quite a bit. Right. I mean, this sort of, um, you know, this sort of recur, this notion of recursive self-improvement, I guess that, hmm. you know, the, the runaway foom, maybe we can, we can address, right. Like, um, right. recursive self-improvement is something we've tried in, in, in machine learning for a very long time. It's called meta-learning, right? You, you have right. a system that learns how to accelerate the learning and you have also architecture search algorithms. The reality is that the, the larger the space over which you search, the exponentially harder things become, it, it, it becomes to find the, 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 the true optimum, right? And so what that means is that if we task an AI to improve AI, it's, 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 exponentially more complicated every level of like an AI that improves an AI that improves an AI you go right um and so it's going to take exponentially more compute uh, and energy right uh, to achieve that optimum right and so in a sense there's a sort of there's already a soft cap on compute in terms of the energetic and capital costs of of compute and that keeps us safe right and it, in a, in a sense like Everything, everything in 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 our civilization, even every life form, is trying to foom. Everything is trying to grow, and that is the thesis of of EAC. And but that 
because everything is trying to grow and competing with one, one another mm -hmm. for resources, we yield, we, we get uh, better optima, but it also keeps everything in check. There's not mm -hmm. one sort of singleton, you know, uh, biological uh, 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 system or one single company or one single nation that takes over the whole system, right? Uh, and because they're, they're, they're competing with one another. And, and in general, to find sort of uh, optima of high fitness, for example, you know, if you're, if you're building a company, a company is almost like, at least in the startup space, you know, at the seed round, you're, you're basically a search algorithm. You're searching over the space of technologies and you're burning capital and intellectual compute and, and maybe uh, actual GPU compute to find sort of to pinpoint exactly what product you got to build. That's a couple bits of information, but that's costly. That's a costly thing to find. So every optimum that is high fitness is very costly to find. And the more optimal it is, often it's exponentially costlier to find uh, that optimum. And so that keeps us safe in the sense that I can pretty confidently say we're not just a small at a distance, like this one weird trick where like now we have super AGI that fooms and creates gray goo and takes over the world. Like that's, li that's like very exponentially unlikely. Uh, that, 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 that is the case. You can't guarantee it, right? You can't guarantee that there's not one weird hack, but from what we've seen so far, it's taken billions of years to get where we are now with, uh, life and intelligence as we know it. And it's been a very long sort of process of, exp of, of improvement, uh, to this point. Um, but there sh there won't be a sort of hyperbolic discontinuity in, in the rate in which things improve. And, in general, we, we take the opposite camp, like th this sort of rate of self-improvement of everything is actually really important. And it's what um, uh, uh, creates uh, the, everything we enjoy. Uh, and we should uh, seek to, to, to keep that process go growing and scale it, right? Um, really like systems in nature uh, either get busy growing or they get busy dying, right? Uh, and so they either secure more resources, secure, secure more free energy and figure out cleverer ways to utilize it in order to, 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 to grow, or they try to stagnate, they run out of fuel and then they die. That is it. Mm -hmm. Everything runs on some type of fuel. Nothing is forever. No bit of information is forever to maintain its coherence. It costs energy because everything wants to decohere naturally. Everything wants to sort of you know, it's a, it's a constant fight against entropy. And so the, the thesis of EAC is the one golden metric to some extent that measures the progress of the whole system is sort of free energy. How much energy are we uh, acquiring and consuming as a civilization? Because that's a metric of our progress that can't be gamed, right? If you, if you, and, and you, this will resonate with you guys, but if you measure it in US dollars, that's not, that's not objective scale. Right. Uh, you know, uh, that's that's not a scale. That, that's a scale that you can you, pl you can play with. You can, uh, you know, in, in, in inflate thing. You can have inflation. Uh, you can you can print money. And, and, and then it seems like you have some progress, but really, really, you went the other the wrong way. Whereas something objective like energy is a good metric to measure progress. And we think that um, scaling up civilization and 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 doing so with urgency is how we uh, ensure it's sort of long-term success and existence. Uh, and I think that the one of the most dangerous things we could do is let this mindset of doom and demoralization uh, become hyperstitious, right? If you focus on doom, you focus on 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 dark darker futures. Um, well, first of all, you stop building, you stop having having children. You stop hoping for better things in the future. It sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that's how civilizations and empires uh, die, and, and that mm -hmm. will cause massive pain. And so we're on a mission to spread sort of optimism that is hyperstitious in the sense, yes, we can do it. We can build better things. We can build a better future. We can leverage AI to build the better future we want, to cure diseases, to tackle climate change, to unlock nuclear fusion, nuclear energy, massive prosperity. We have all this upside on the table. And the longer we wait, 
uh, the longer we wait, uh, th the lower likelihood we can achieve it. And we, we have urgency to make it happen. And, and, and that's very similar to a mindset you have in startups in Silicon Valley, right? The most successful startups are very optimistic and, and they believe they can do something that seems like unimaginable at the beginning of the company, but then they do it and it, it just keeps happening, right? And it's this sort of hyperstitious optimism uh, effect. And that's the sort of mentality we're trying to scale to the world uh, with EAC. And it's why we think that doomerism and pessimism is, is really dangerous and needs to be fought somewhat aggressively, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, because that is actually the source of doom, not some sort of fictitious uh, artificial super intelligence from sci-fi. It's not backed by science, right? Um, you know, I've worked on AI for material generation, protein folding, biochemistry, chemistry, all like AI for the physical world. It's much harder than people think, right? The physical world is really hard. And one of the best uh, uh, things at designing things in the physical world is life itself. But you could see life itself as a big optimization algorithm that is trying to foom. Every life form is trying to foom, and yet nothing has foomed, right? So that should give you a bit more peace, and you you you, you can breathe. Um, and but, but happy to go into any sort of argument, like any sticking points you have about uh, Yad's argument. One thing you've mentioned a couple of times is this word foom. Could you define that really quick for people? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, well, how how do you understand foom? Mm. Like from your interview with Yud, um, how would you explain it? Yeah, I think I think you're using it in a very general sense, which I yeah. think. Um, I wish I appreciate because it kind of uh, gets down to the bare metal of kind of how life works. Like life is interested in life. Like life is interested in propagating. Foom in the AI sense is main is mostly talking about that uh, super intelligence explosion where AI just takes over everything and it's all it's just like this one single event and all of a sudden the whole world is AI and it's run by AIs for AIs. Um, trees want to uh, plant more trees. You know, uh, bugs want there to be more bugs. Ants wants more ants. Humans want more humans. Uh, and I think this is, it, it's all trying to hit some sort of like um, uh, point in a curve, which like once the ball starts rolling, it starts rolling faster and faster and faster. And all of a sudden we have like a population explosion. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of life form you are, but like everything is trying to look for that like growth in population. That is something that's fundamental about life. And so you're using it in a general sense where it's just like, hey, yep. any system that uh, any system whatsoever that's propagating is trying to find more energy because that's how it can propagate even more. And this is eco this is the playing field that just the universe exists on. And I think that this is how you're using it. it it's every, every system and subsystem, whether it's a company, a group of people, a culture, uh, like you said, bugs, trees, whatever, um, even nation states, uh, everything is self-organizing, self-adapting its inner workings in order to 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 grow and by construction things that are not optimizing themselves to grow burn, run out of fuel and they fade and that's it right and so if you think about if you think in the future which culture which um like if, if you think of like several nations in the future which nations will have survived and what culture would they have right mm. well they would probably have an EAC culture that is literally by construction trying to figure out what is the optimal way to organize ourselves in order to grow. And the sort of pessimistic, doomeristic uh, cultures will have faded because they'll have destroyed themselves. This kind of reminds, reminds me, by the way, of an episode we did with uh, Robin Hansen about like mm -hmm. his theory for Probably why we haven't seen uh, aliens is ba basically that it's, it, for one, it's too early, but like we will see them. And the ones we will see are not the quiet aliens that stick to their mm. home home planet, not the the right. D cell aliens. We'll see the EAC aliens, the grabby <laughs> aliens that go mm, and they right. they consume their solar system, they consume their galaxy, and then they're a multi galaxy uh, type of um, like the grabby ones are the ones that are effectively going to foom and win. Yeah, well, it's it's the same with like um, you know variants of a virus, right? It's the ones that have higher replicability that you get statistically. Right. You don't see like earlier variants that are lower fitness. Right. Um, and it's like ev everything, everything, every bit of information is getting selected for in, in terms of does it confer 
uh, the organism in, uh, of which is part of uh, an ability to, to grow, right? Mm -hmm. um, like your, your genetics, it's like, does this piece of the genetic code give you higher fitness? Does it, you know, uh, uh, make you have more offspring? And then that piece of code, uh, genetic code is higher likelihood in the future, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like applying that sort of evolutionary thinking to everything, including culture, including ways to organize your companies, including you can think of, you know, that sort of thinking even applied to crypto, right? Which, which right. sort of uh, uh, coins have the best sort of mimetic right. uh, fitness in, in, in the long term. Bitcoin right? maximalism and, is the Bitcoin foomers. They think Bitcoin <laughs> is going to foom. Well, well, I don't know about that. What I do like about Bitcoin is that uh, it is proof of work. And right. so it is anchored to sort of physics and mm -hmm. energy consumption. And, you know, I'm not necessarily a Bitcoin maximalist, but I am a sort of energy maximalist. Yeah. I think that is the, the right metric to, to, to pin things with respect to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to um, provide the way that I see the structure of this conversation. But sure. if you have like a very like um, basement first principles uh, grounding in your arguments, and I, that is like what I would consider like, you know, the very the depth of where some of this belief structure comes from. Uh, but we've watched um, and we've watched uh, a lot of this, um, these conversations permeate throughout like Silicon Valley and then also make its way into like Capitol Hill where some mm. of these like very first principle arguments are inspiring or being argued against as like political stances about the direction for society at large. Yeah. So it kind of goes back to just like, we have some beliefs, we have a structure of thought. Um, it's very, it can get very technical and granular in their base principle arguments. But then as this conversation progresses and Ryan's going to take us into the next phase here, it really can inspire like a political belief, uh, like a direction, a proposed direction for humanity. Uh, and so this is kind of what you, why Ryan kind of uh, illustrated this as like you're you're inspiring like a movement, like a political movement of um, not necessarily a party because that's too structured, but just like a set of beliefs for how yeah. we ought to live as a uh, as humanity, as a species. Is this how this is how you see it? Yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully it does affect uh, politics, right? It's like our, the ways we we've been organizing ourselves, the ways we've been legislating have been pretty far from optimal, and we should think from a, a first principle standpoint, you know, what is, how, how do we organize uh, sort of a hierarchy of cybernetic control in our civilization? And this is a very deep concept. So how, how do we, you know, in, in a sense, like it's very similar to crypto, many layers of a protocol, right? You have sort of, you, you check, you, you chunk blocks, and then you have different layers that check at different uh, scales, right? Um, and, and, and base layers have a slower clock rate and they, they, they roll up uh, larger amounts of, 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 of uh, actions or transactions. Um, it's, it's very similar to having a hierarchy of sort of legislation at the local, you know, provincial or state level and then national level and then international level, right? As you go up the hierarchy, you should have a slower feedback loop and it should be lighter and lighter touch in terms of its its ability to control things. And I, you know, the goal with EAC is to start a discussion of like, how do, how should we balance things? Cause you know, one side of the aisle wants everyone to be hands off. One side of the aisle wants like absolute total control in the hands of a few. Uh, and, and both of those things are not optimal, right? There's a spectrum in between and, and we should search over that spectrum. Um, it's, it, and it, it, it's very relevant to the centralization versus decentralization question in crypto uh, for protocols. I think I think they're they're the same question whether it's in in politics versus crypto, like is a system that is uh, like totally decentralized and greedy optimal versus one that is centralized versus one that is hierarchical. I, I I think it's the I think it's the latter, and maybe we can we can get into that. But hopefully that does inspire conversations on Capitol Hill um, and in DC about. Uh, where to take policy and legislation. Yeah, I think it's really important. I think that this uh, EAC, um, you know, do we accelerate or do we de-accelerate is, is probably one of the most important conversations that society is, is having. And like EAC to me, one question I was going to have for you, Beth, is like, is EAC, of, is it a philosophy? Is it like a, a movement? Uh, is this like a social revolution? Is it a religion of some sorts? Is it like this amorphous thing like crypto where it's like a grab bag of all of the above? What's your take on this? 
I think it's all of the above to some extent, right? I mean, f- for me, it's, you know, it's almost like religious like belief just because it's like, I, I can get into that. But, um, you know, and, and for some it is, um, for some it's a, you know, it's a community of, of like-minded individual that are optimistic about the future and trying to help each other and, 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 and want to build to this better future and collaborate. And, you know, for some it's sort of, um, a political or ideological movement of how we should, uh, legislate things or how we should run things. Um, and for some it's just, I don't know, inspirational, uh, and gets them fired up to, to build more. To continue leveling up your crypto game, then you need to get on the Bankless newsletter. It's the world's most popular crypto email and is completely free. Just click below to sign up.